Hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, thank you guys for showing up, and also to the internet audience. If you guys tuned in online, thank you for tuning in to see this thing. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how I got out of my comfort zone and got uh, into the moment and started connecting more uh, with the moment in photography to sort of get into the zone. Um, and to do that, I'm going to start off by giving you a little bit of a, uh, uh, my history um, in photography. So I started off as a photographer because my father uh, was a photographer, as a hobbyist, and he had cameras and he also taught photography in high school. Um, so uh, I had experience in the dark room. We'd go in there on weekends and play around in the dark room. And uh, he actually helped me build uh, my first camera, which was a pinhole camera, out of a shoebox. Which, uh, once I knew I was going to make this speech, I had them kind of dig it up. I still had it in the garage, so they dug it up and uh, snapped a couple photos of it for me. So that's it right there. That was my first camera. The shutter is just that little thing you move over there and the photo paper, if any of you guys out there kind of remember that whole process. Um, but then when I took off to college, I sort of dropped my hobbies and uh, I guess because I was studying a little too much, um, so I got carried away in the college life. Um, but about two years into it, I picked up a camera of a different kind and it was a video camera because the first uh, real good digital video cameras were starting to come out. And so me and my friends started making uh, a lot of just like silly college kid kind of videos um, and we were just playing around with it. I mean, uh, nothing like important, but you know, dressing up our friends as Smurfs and painting them and having them run through like luxury resorts just to get people's reactions until we got kicked out and fun stuff. Um, but what it really did for me was basically uh, reinvigorate my interest in the uh, visual arts. Um, so when I moved back to LA, uh, I started working as a, uh, as a production assistant on music videos and commercials, and uh, somehow I ended up in the TV news broadcast world. Um, but uh, when you have time, and it's, that's a freelance life. So uh, I'm sure that if there's a lot of you out there that are freelancers and you understand the freelance life, there's a lot of time that you have to fill, and you can either fill that time being destructive <laughs> or you can fill that time being productive. So I decided to make an attempt at being productive and I started publishing, I created and started publishing a, uh, a music and arts magazine, um, a print magazine, if you can believe or remember that those once really existed all over the place. Um, so uh, so this is, these are a bunch of the covers and it was a bunch of, uh, we had like a lot of artists, a lot of photographers, a lot of environmentalists, a lot of musicians and that sort of thing. Um, but if you know the publishing industry, it's basically any position in the publishing industry is three full-time jobs in itself. Uh, so it takes up a lot of your time. Um, but on top of that, at the same time, I also held a full-time day job as a video editor, uh, editing news video packages and corporate media packages for people like, uh, like Entertainment Tonight and Access Hollywood and Insider. Uh, our clients, I think, were General Motors and Gap. Uh, Mattel was a big client. Um, so I was part of the media machine and I was very well ingrained in the media machine and it consumed my entire waking life and that was basically my entire life because you never slept in that world. Um, and then 2009 hit. When 2009 hit, uh, jobs started paying less, the hours started going up, the publishing industry <laughs> went down. It forced me to, I had to shut down the magazine at that point. Um, oh, I also, I decided it would be a good idea to open a cafe in the middle of a recession, which was brilliant on my part. Um, so that had to shut down also. Uh, I was in the middle of a uh, dysfunctional relationship. Um, the bosses of the company were in the middle of their own dysfunctional relationship uh, that caused a dysfunctional company. And uh, I was over it. By that point, it had been almost a decade and I was just mentally, physically, emotionally just done. Um, my breaking point was really when I realized that the closest thing I had to a personal relationship was spending nine or ten hours a day in an edit bay uh, editing footage of Barbie. Because uh, Mattel was one of our clients and Barbie was paying a lot of bills at that point. Um, I was done. I just I knew something had to change because things just weren't going in the trajectory that I had hoped that they would be going and by that point. Um, so I needed to just kind of like take a break. So I decided at one point to just take a drive up the coast. So if you're familiar with LA, there's a, if you go past Santa Monica, it turns into Pacific Coast Highway and it just starts going up the coast towards Malibu. And I turned onto a road that I had never turned onto before and that was uh, Topanga Canyon Boulevard. And uh, 
when I turned onto that road, uh, it was pretty much cathartic because I had lived my whole life in Santa Monica and Venice and Culver City, like that whole area. And I never knew that that area of Los Angeles even existed. Um, and it was really magical because this is only 15 or 20 minutes away from Santa Monica. This is only 30 minutes away from downtown LA. This is maybe 35 minutes LA from Hollywood. Um, and it was so, uh, uh, like such a far different world up there, yet so close. So if I needed to do work, I could still get back down there um, if I had to. But uh, it basically gave me the twinge of a feeling that those little worlds that we live in and those bubbles and that bubble that I was living in down there was uh, just that. It was just a bubble. And outside of that bubble, there's this entire world out there that we so rarely pay attention to. And I know that I really didn't pay very much attention to it because I was just consumed by my life. And that kind of was the first glimpse of like, wow, uh, there's all this other stuff out there. And that really just reinvigorated that life in me. So when I was just starting to kind of die inside, for lack of a better term, um, that really started to kind of give me life um, back up again. Um, and that feeling stuck with me. Oh, sorry, these were some of the clients. <laughs> Um, and this is Topanga. So I basically, uh, when I first got up there and I drove up there, I didn't really know what I was getting into, but within a month, I was living up there. Um, and at first, I really didn't know what to make of it because it was a very, uh, a very extremely uh, rash decision. But at the same time, um, I knew for, for some reason that there was a reason that I was doing it. And uh, for the first couple of months, I was kind of scared because... I wasn't hearing and experiencing the things I was used to, which was uh, police sirens, things smashing in the middle of the night, police choppers, uh, just you know the noises that um that make you feel like if you live in the city that make you feel like everything is okay, <laughs> um, like everything is normal. Um, instead, I started to hear uh, uh, weird things like owls. I started to hear things like wind rustling in the trees, coyotes in the middle of the night, um, and that was freaking me out. Um, but it only took a couple of months where I started to feel, uh, uh, not only did I start missing it, I started to long to go back home because those are the things that I wanted to engulf myself back into um, because they just felt good. Uh, they started to feel really good. Um, within a few weeks after I got acclimated with it, I began hiking every single day. Uh, within a few months, I started volunteering at Malibu Creek State Park, which is uh, one of the state parks uh, that was closest to me. I started spending a lot of time in Topanga Canyon State Park. Um, I started traveling to other state parks and national parks because there's this whole world that just opened up to me that, that I, I, I just felt connected to for some reason. It just, it just really touched me and it came into my life like at a time that I really needed it. And I find out, you know, come to find out later that I really brought that into my life uh, when I needed it. There was a reason that I was up there at that time. Um, even within a couple of years, I went through the whole application process to become a state park ranger which, well, that's, that's a story for another time. Um, but the beauty of it, again, was that it was so close to work, so close to LA, so close to where the places that I needed to be if I needed to make money uh, to pay the bills and all that kind of stuff, but it was far enough away uh, to where I didn't have to deal with it, and I knew that when I was done with work, I can go back to this pretty much magical enclave. Um, and then I started to look forward to those 10 minutes when I turned onto my street, which is old Topanga Canyon Road, there's no reception. And I don't know when the last time you guys went without reception was. Uh, it's, it's, you have to get used to it because you almost kind of feel naked. But after a while, um, I started to really love it and I started to look forward to it. And then I would turn the stereo off. I would put the windows down. I would start to feel the fresh air hitting my face. Um, I even started to grow fond of the horse uh, dung smell <laughs> that you hear from stables and ranches and stuff on windy mountain roads. That one took a while, um, but it, it really changed everything for me. Um, I've never experienced that before. Um, living and working in like the most media saturated city uh, in the world, you don't really think about those things and everything is always deadline oriented. And when things are deadline oriented, you don't have the time to process things. You only have the time to react to things. Um, because if you don't, the, the fear is uh, that you'll miss out on an opportunity, someone will take that place, that, uh, 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 that the fear is basically you'll be left behind. Um, when in reality, 
when you remove yourself from that situation and you get to see it from a removed perspective and you see it from the outside, only then do you realize that there is so much static that you are engulfed in that you're never really able to kind of be in tune and in touch with yourself. And it's really a scary thing uh, uh, for, for someone who's not used to that. So I don't know how many of you people live in rural areas or have experienced that. If you grew up and you spent all the time in the city, it's just, it's, it's a really weird thing to be that uh, in touch with yourself um, because it's kind of scary at first. Um, but what happens after a while is that the more that you become in touch and in tune with yourself and the more that you start paying attention, um, the more that you start paying attention to that perspective that you get from out there, uh, you get the chance to absorb and feel instead of just react. And as a result, I began to really trust my gut and my intuition more. And my gut and intuition began to guide my direction instead of the billboards and the TV shows and the, uh, uh, you know, the flashing color bars and tones and people telling you what you should be doing and all this kind of stuff. Um, instead, you really have to kind of learn to start trusting yourself. And when you start trusting yourself, um, or when I started trusting myself, it basically gave me the chance and the space to realize my extreme love and passion uh, for the outdoors in our natural world. And uh, I knew I was always drawn to it, but never did I realize that it would basically become the defining aspect of my entire life. Um, my everything that I do now is is geared in that world and in that direction. Um, quite simply, the more time I spent there, the better I felt. Um, these are some of the images that I started capturing while I was up there. Uh, and this, believe it or not, again is only 25 minutes from Los Angeles. Like the, the, this next series of pictures are just right up the coast, and you would never think it, and I never thought it, and I grew up there for about 30 years before I realized that even was there. Um, this is in Topanga Canyon, that's uh, the horseback riding thing. Um, there's like a stable up there to do horseback riding, it was just a ridiculously insane sunset that day. And I just kind of sat there watching the sunset and the horse just meandered into the shot, and I was like, did you know I was here? You know, it was uh, ridiculous. Um, and the thing is, is now that there's literally quantifiable science that shows that your chemical composition uh, changes when you're in nature, when you find yourself outside in a hike, when you find yourself near a stream or a river or in between trees, um, there's actually science that is now coming out showing how that actually affects your brain. And it reduces stress and it reduces anxiety and it reduces depression and it has all these effects that people mostly do not pay attention to because we're just caught up in our own little devices. Um, uh, so over time, uh, my frame of mind and thought process of this being able to process things instead of react to things uh, started to spill over into my photography. Um, so now I'll often find myself uh, where I would normally start shooting without abandon. Um, now I find, and hoping I'd get a good shot, now I'd find myself sometimes not clicking the shutter for minutes, sometimes hours. Um, and if I have the luxury of time, sometimes even days, I won't even click a shutter because I really kind of want to get a feel for the environment and a feel for the situation and I want to uh, uh, I want to smell it I want to feel it I want it to become a part of me because once you're there and you identify with it and it starts becoming a part of you the work that you produce reflects that if you just start shooting snapshots and you just start shooting shots because you're there and something's pretty there that's a great shot it's a nice picture to look at but it doesn't really uh, uh, it's, it's it's not you and in order to make it you, you have to kind of absorb that situation. And living in those hills and living on those mountains and being exposed uh, to that opportunity to kind of like let go and absorb things, it really gave me the chance to, uh, uh, to start doing that. And so now whenever I look at any one of these images, I go back to what the weather was like. I go back to what I was thinking about. I go back to how I was feeling. Um, all because I made that image my own, because I spent the time to really absorb the environment that was around me. Um, basically, the more connected you feel to something, the closer it is to you, the more it stays with you, and that puts you in the space to make it your own. Um, so I'm going to give you a few examples of how I started to notice that over time. Uh, you've all been there. You've shown up to a location you've been waiting and planning for. Then you find two dozen photographers doing the same thing. They're lined up next to each other at the ready to go home with the same frame. Um, and I can't express how important it is to actually shoot that shot. Uh, I think it was actually the godfather of photography, Rick Salmon, who was here speaking yesterday, uh, who I first heard that from, it's really important to get that shot, but not because uh, to have that shot on your memory card, 
but basically to get it out of the way. Because once you have that shot out of the way, um, you free yourself uh, from the self-induced pressure to get that shot, and now you're free to play, and you're free to find the shot, and you're free to f uh, uh, do what you need to do to basically make that same environment your own, um, instead of somebody else's shot, or the shot you see a million times. Um, I'm gonna give you now three examples that demonstrated that for me. So, oh, these are still some more images from Topanga Canyon. So this is what I traded the city life in, which is only 25 <laughs> minutes away uh, for this stuff. So this shot, this is the sun setting over Malibu Creek State Park, um, off of Mulholland Highway going through the Santa Monica Mountains. This is about 45 minutes from LA. And uh, it was a summer solstice about three years ago. And I knew that I wanted to get a sunset shot, but I didn't want to get a beach sunset shot. So I just started driving and I pull up to an overlook that I knew pretty well because I drive that road a lot to go uh, wander through those mountains. Um, and when I got to the overlook, there were like four or five photographers that were, sit they were set up. They had their tripods all eye level and they were waiting for the sun to start setting. Um, but I had been up there long enough to know that that's not what I wanted. And I just kind of wanted to feel the whole situation. So I just started walking about maybe 20. 25 feet to the right. I found a gate, I walked around the gate, and I sat down to just feel the weather. I mean, it was like 70 something, it was perfect. There was a, like a slight breeze coming in. Um, it was just a beautiful moment. And when I sat down, I saw this sagebrush that was in front of me, and they were just glowing. Like the tips of the dry flowers were just glowing. And this was maybe about 30 minutes after I had gotten there, and I realized this is the shot that I want. So I sat down, set up the tripod, and just waited for the sun to set and snapped that shot. I snapped maybe three or four frames of it, and that was it. And I knew immediately that uh, uh, that made it my own um, because I felt that experience and it translated when I shared the image. People also responded really well to that image. So I started to get the sense that I was doing my job. Um, another example was, so there's the Bixby Bridge up in Big Sur in California, if you've ever driven the, uh, the PCH. And you don't have much space to really work with, big, with that Bixby Bridge because, I mean, 180 degrees of it is ocean, so you can't shoot from there unless you have a boat or something. Uh, about 45 degrees is covered by a coastal mountain, so you've got about 30 to 45 degrees of space to really find an angle. And I had been up here several times. I've gotten the angle that I've, you know, the traditional angle that you do when you do a Google image search, but I didn't want that um, this time. So we continued on a little bit further. We saw some downed trees. We saw the remnants of a trail. We crawled through the trees, uh, went through the trail, um, and it opened up into this overlook that uh, of the dozens of times I've been up there, I never really knew it was there, but I just wanted to explore. So we found it, we sat there, and the same thing. The breeze started coming in, the sun started to set, the light started to uh, just get pink and purple and just beautiful, those California sunsets. Um, and when I turned around and I saw the Bixby Bridge and how it was, I knew that this was where I wanted to get my image because I hadn't seen this vantage point before. And that was this. Um, so I found the natural trimming of the, free, of, the, uh, of the trees that we were sitting in between, uh, feeling the breeze, watching that sunset. And now the bridge is not the focal point, but the bridge is a part of the entire scene and the situation that we were in. So again, this one also got a lot of good response. Um, and I was really happy with this one. I like it better than my traditional uh, Bixby Bridge image. These are some other ones from Big Sur. This is Keyhole Rock. Uh, and another example, now this is Yosemite, Mariposa Grove. It's a, a grove of giant sequoia trees um, that are some of the oldest trees in the world. And when you first show up, it's extremely overwhelming because it's just these huge 2,000 year old trees. And I'm not exaggerating when you say 2,000 years old, they're literally that old. Um, and your first instinct is, how am I gonna get this entire tree into the shot? Uh, you're not, unless you use a really wide angle lens or a fisheye or something like that. But when you do that, you kind of distort the sense of the awe that you get when you see that tree. And so then I had to break it down. And I walked around for about an hour and a half, maybe two hours, and I started to break it down. What is it about these trees that I want to capture? Um, their beauty, uh, how majestic they were, how large they were, and how small they made me feel. And so then as I was walking through, I found the little, uh, the little sapling tree that was starting to grow and I just framed it so we have the huge bark. This one is probably about 11 or 1200 years old. And so then you can kind of see like the sense of scale and awe of these trees. There's another one, the light was just shining on that one. I had to, I mean, how can you not snap that shot? <laughs> um, 
And so this is, okay, Glacier Point up in Yosemite. Uh, it's the same kind of idea. Um, I've been up to Glacier Point before and I had to get this shot because that's the iconic one. Uh, this one as well, you see these shots all the time. But I went up there last time and um, this was in spring of this year where we went up one night, I got the shots, the iconic shots. And then the next night I knew that uh, there was something in me the whole next day, me and uh, my cousin's husband, who's also a photographer, uh, we were up there. And we knew that we wanted to go back and order because we, we weren't satisfied. We wanted to get something that was our own. Um, so we went back up there the next night and uh, I started walking around again. And the thing that I wanted to capture there was that sense, if you've ever been there, uh, when you roll up into Yosemite and you see Glacier Point or even from Tunnel View, it opens up into this majestic view that if you don't feel something when you see that for the first time, then I, I can't help you. <laughs> You're not human. There's, there's something wrong. Um, it's just so awe-inspiring, and I knew that that's what I wanted to capture was that first anticipation sense of what is about to open up in front of me. So as I was walking around, all the photographers were lined up to get the classic view. Um, I found myself between the trees, and I saw this. And I saw Half Dome just glowing uh, just as the sun was setting. We were getting the twilight, and, uh, and I knew that that was my shot because that started to give me that anticipation of what is about to open up in front of me. What is this insane scene that is in front of me that I'm about to see? And that's what I wanted to capture. And I think that for me, that captured that really well. Um, and so since then, I've basically dedicated uh, most of my life to working with the state parks and the national parks and trying to bring awareness to our natural world out there. Because the, uh, ironically, the technologies that we have are actually bringing a lot more interest to worlds that most people never knew existed, especially if you live in big cities. Um, this is another one just off PCH. This ended up actually being on the cover of a, uh, of a national park magazine for like hiking and trails up in that area. Um, and just recently I worked with Subaru and the national park system. They got together to do a zero landfill initiative in which they, uh, uh, they've committed to emptying all the trash out of all the national parks. And it's a two year initiative and they reached out to me to use one of my images from Yosemite. So. I cannot tell you how honored I am that they're using one of my images to help tell that story to a, uh, uh, to a cause that I hold really dear to myself that I would have never discovered if I just didn't make that turn up on a Topanga Canyon Boulevard, you know, eight years before. Um, so basically, here's the thing. While our daily lives can put us into anxiety-ridden situations um, in which we have an obsessive focus on the past uh, or the future, uh, ruminate on things that happened, um, once you pull that camera up to your face and you see nothing but that rectangle uh, of light and you get to fill that rectangle with whatever you want, by definition, you really have no choice but to be caught in the moment. You are in that moment. Um, it could be a fraction of a second, but you are in that moment and you have control over what you want to express through that little rectangle. Um, in a sense, you're basically seeing the light. Um, and I, that's, that's really how it felt to me. Uh, you're in your own moment. There's no past, there's no future, it's just now. Um, and when you can focus on that moment, what the light is actually showing you, uh, something touches you in a way uh, that you can't help but appreciate what you're being shown. And it's when all the other stuff and all the static and all the noise is stripped away, you realize that there are beautiful things everywhere. Um, there's beautiful things all the time. And not only that, but you are actually there to experience some of these. And these are things that when you're going through uh, uh, certain situations in your life, um, you can draw back on these feelings and you can draw back on those experiences and you can draw back on what that did to your mental state uh, to remind yourself that those beautiful things do exist. Because in a world right now that is so fast paced, it really is easy to lose sight of that. Um, but I can't tell you how vital it has been to me and how vital it is to remind yourself of those things. Um, and once those things become so ingrained in you and you become so passionate about them, you cannot help but have to share that and try to transfer that passion onto other people. Uh, and that's, that's, that's what my um, life is now dedicated to um, because it's done so much for me that I wanted to be able to do more for other people. Um, so a couple uh, takeaways uh, a couple takeaway tips to try to make the moment your own. Oh, these are some other images that I don't have much time, so I got to roll through them. This one was Sri Lanka earlier this year. Uh, it's in Kandy, 
which is the cultural capital of the country, and there's an overlook on Buddha's shoulder. This is an 800-foot statue that everyone, when you go there, you have to go see the sunset from the shoulder of Buddha. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to go see the sunset from the shoulder of Buddha. So I went up there, and I watched the sun start to set, but then the twilight started to hit, and it was backlighting the statue. And I was like, okay, I want to go see what the statue looks like. So I went back down, and I literally just sat down on the ground um, as the twilight started to show up. Um, and it, all of a sudden, just monks, one out by one, started uh, coming in to go into the temple uh, that was at the base of the statue. And I got the sunset shots that everyone wanted me to get, but it's after I sat here for about 30, 45 minutes watching that light and waiting for the right monk that I wanted to come through. That's the shot that I took home, and that was one of my favorite shots from the trip because I just, I just took that time to, uh, to be there and just really absorb that, that moment and that feeling. This is also in Sri Lanka. This was in the uh, Temple of the Tooth. Um, so these are, these are the points that I wanted, the takeaways. Uh, most importantly, basically slow down. Take your time. Uh, even spend some time without shooting a frame, like, like I was telling you I started to do. Uh, get a feel for the place. Uh, the sights, the smells, uh, the sounds, the environment. Really just soak it in. And if you do that, uh, you won't have to look for an image. It'll, it'll, th that image will just come to you. Um, the next thing is move. Uh, so move around, get low, get high. Uh, with the cameras that we have these days, you can you know, use the articulating screen, get really low, get crazy angles. Um, get those first couple shots out of the way, but never settle for the first two images because your money shot, I guarantee you, is always gonna be at least four or five images in and maybe even further. Um, and the last one is a look up. So, and not in the way that you might think at first, not, not for a shot, but as soon as you hit that shutter and you get the shot and you feel it, uh, just stop and, and turn off the camera and just look up at what you were actually shooting. Um, because you took the time and you took the effort and you took the energy to be in that moment and to feel that uh, if you look back up again after you get it, then all that just starts coming back and it just really makes it even that more special. Um, uh, it makes the experience a lot more valuable and uh, you'll wonder why you really haven't been doing that all along. Um, so you're here in Seattle. I don't know how many of you are locals, how many of you are here from out of town, but uh, I'm from out of town. I've only been here once before. Uh, so you have a chance to really, there's an iconic structure right outside, which is the Space Needle. And we've seen it a million times on Google Images. But you've got a chance to make it your own. And when I was walking uh, back home to the hotel from dinner the other night, um, we don't get fall colors in LA. <laughs> uh, and I saw those trees, and I saw the Space Needle going through those trees, and it was right outside the hotel, and I just sat there. And I was like, that's, 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 if I, if I take that image home with me from Seattle, then I'm happy because um, I haven't seen that image before. I really, I, I sat there, I absorbed it, and, and I really like had a moment with that image or with that situation. Uh, so there's that. So that's all I've got. I think I'm, I believe I'm out of time. I think I've gone over time. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I would have taken questions, but if you have any questions, I'll, uh, I'll be off to the side of the stage or at the Samsung booth. You can find me back there as well, um, and I'll be happy to talk to you and answer any questions. So thank you.